Letters from Siberia. My entire adult life I've been bothered by what I call historical imbalance. The fact that people living both in Canada and the United States know very well the atrocities that Hitler committed, but know very little of what Stalin did. And the scope and size of Stalin's atrocities far exceed that of Hitler. That's always bothering me, just the historical imbalance. The justice imbalance is even bigger. Right after World War II, the Nazi perpetrators of death and destruction were apprehended. The Nuremberg trials took place, they were sentenced. And this apprehension, uh, trials and sentencing is still continues till today. With regard to the terror that was produced uh, by Stalin and his henchmen, not one single person has been held accountable so far. More so, there is a risk of recurrence of Stalinism. History has a tendency to repeat itself, especially if you forget it. Throughout the entire Soviet empire, there are areas and pockets where Stalinism is very popular. Uh, there are areas in China, the same thing is taking place. And in countries such as North Korea, it's run on a Stalinist principle. It can recur, it can come back. And it's so important to realize the pain and suffering that these kinds of ideologies can produce. The summer of 2011 is the 70 year anniversary of the beginnings of the mass deportations from the Baltic Republics. I thought that would be a reasonable time to try to do an exhibit and a program about this subject. Two years ago I sat down with Stanley Balzekas of the Balzekas Museum and we decided to go forward with this program. This has turned into a rather multifaceted uh, program, not only an exhibit, but also book signings, films, poetry, readings of letters and reminiscences, and and it's been a rather involving project for the past two years. I do want to mention about the title of Hope and Spirit. Uh, although what we're dealing with is death and deportation, rather dark subjects, still many people were able to survive. It was their hope and their spirit that kept them going. Within my own blood relatives, out of the eight people who were deported, seven survived and were able to return. It was their spirit that kept them going. And in the Lithuanian people, that hope and that spirit persisted for decades, many decades, and then eventually it flowered in the independence of Lithuania. And from Lithuania, the entire Soviet bloc started to disintegrate and fell apart because of the seeds that were planted in the hearts of people in Lithuania itself. So it was to commemorate not just the people who suffered and died, but to also commemorate the people who survived and were able then, despite severe adversity, uh, see Lithuania uh, to freedom uh, once again. So that's why the title Hope and Spirit. The deportations that took place were of two uh, basic types. Uh, one type was to prison camps where there was barbed wire. And these photographs were taken by Jozef Kozlowskis. He himself was deported with his mother to Siberia when he was seven years old. He was there for eight years until 15. And then in 1988, with uh, travel restrictions being uh, lifted, he and other people were able to go back to the sites where they were deported. And these photographs show the barbed wire, the fences that were used in, the, in these hard labor prison gulags. Along with him, people did come back and visited the sites. And these are images of people back and visiting the cells that they were incarcerated in and the prison camps where they were held. The other uh, type of deportations, uh, and this number is here is probably about 150,000 from Lithuania alone, uh, were to much less restrictive uh, areas. These were basically to use people as slave labor in forestry, agriculture, mining, and in the high Arctic, uh, in the fishing industries. People were apprehended because they had something. You had a violin, you had a piano, you had an education, you were an accountant, you were a lawyer, you were a doctor, a, a teacher, you had something you were bourgeoisie and you were a potential threat to the new Soviet system. By far the, the category that was deported in largest numbers were people who owned small family farms. And I emphasize the word small because in North America these really are small areas uh, where families themselves would raise uh, animals and, and take care of the crops themselves. People who were deported uh, into these less restricted environments were per, three quarters of them were women and children. In the first photo montage, which are very rare uh, pictures of actual uh, trains being filled up, uh, these are actually cattle cars that were used to transport animals. Uh, you see people uh, standing outside of the one cattle car, and then in the bottom picture, all of them have been put inside the car, the, the doors have been locked, you see the faces looking out. And it's the same uh, cattle car because you see the same numbers and insignia on it. And the people in there, three quarters of them, were women and children. 
and the rest were elderly. It is hard to understand and at all fathom the horror of the trip just to be taken there, where you had so many people, children, infants, sick, elderly, all squished together in these cattle cars uh, for continuously for, for over a month, and the infamous hole in the floor where all bodily functions for everybody had to be through that one uh, orifice. In the map, you see to the far left in green is Lithuania and the Baltic countries. That's where Europe is. You see the vast expanse of the size of Siberia. The deportations primarily took place to the central part of this map. Uh, this was 3,000 miles by train, by cattle car, and it would take four to six weeks to get there. Other people from there were then put on boats and barges and were taken up to the far north of the Arctic Ocean to work in the fishing industry up there. In organizing this exhibit and program, it was very important to have materials. Uh, we knew that Father Prunskis, uh, who was the editor of the newspaper Drogas in Chicago, uh, had collected a lot of material which he used in the publication of a book in 1981 called Lithuanians in Siberia. And it took us quite a long time to sort out looking different archival sources until finally in the Lithuanian Research and Study Center, we were able to find two boxes with his material. And based on his book, uh, we think we probably have about one fourth of the material that he was able to collect. In all, we have on display over 230 uh, photographs. We have over 200 letters, uh, over 25 letters written by children and uh, envelopes, about 71 of them. Uh, these were sent to people, relatives, uh, primarily in North America, but also to New Zealand, Australia, and South America also. I would like to uh, thank uh, Dr. Augustinus Idzelis and the staff members of Lithuanian Research and Study Center for the generously loaning the material uh, that's on display, the letters, photographs, and envelopes. Uh, we had a formal reading of the letters uh, performed by uh, Luca Chaparnes and Sam DeSanto in January of 2012, and they are participating today uh, in this uh, recording session of the letters. Uh, letters from Siberia, uh, the Shakis family. The family was deported from Lithuania to Siberia for 11 years. Uh, they were sent to the Krasnoyarsk region. Uh, in the photograph, the father is Jozef Shukis, and the children sitting around him are Jozukas, Alexite, and Aldute. We have letters written by all the children, by Jozef Shukis, and also by uh, his wife, Anelia Shukis. Aldute Shukite, dear aunt, wishing you all the best for Easter. We received your presents. The shoes fit me. Yozukas took the wallet, only Alexita was saddened, but she quickly recovers. My shoes are very pretty and fit well. I thank you very much. Make sure to stay healthy and do not worry too much about us. I am healthy, the best student in the second grade. Goodbye, with love, Alduta. Yozukas Shukis. Dear aunt and everyone, I am Yozukas, and I am sending greetings from the far north. From all of us, I thank you for the delicious chocolate. We've never seen anything like that. Even though our mother tried to save as much of it as possible, she did give us small pieces. We have eaten all of it. Very delicious. It has been very hot for several days. Mom is digging potatoes and I help her. But I came home sad. My arms are thin and weak and I cannot handle the hoe. Above all, I want berries, apples, and a large field where we could all run and play freely. With God and with respect, you Azukas. P.S. Someone wrote to you how good we are. Our mother says there are better children. You us Shukis. I was surprised receiving your letter. Our son, you Azukas, is eight years old and is in second grade. Our daughter, Aldute, six years old. Our smallest, Alexita is two years old. Here, schools are taught only in Russian. If we had to live here the way we did the first year, our bones would have rotted away long ago if we had not received the help and support from our relatives. We've now become accustomed 
to all of the local practices and to the Siberian cold. This winter, the temperature reached minus 48 degrees. When there's no wind, it is tolerable. But on a windy day, words cannot describe the cold and cannot describe the difficulties that we have had to live through. We're waiting for a better tomorrow. We do not know when this time of longing and sorrow will end, when we will be able to return to our beloved country and enjoy the sandy beaches of the Shventoya River. Now, a few words about where we live. We live amongst mountains, such that in whatever direction you look, all you can see are mountains and forests. My work is with the forests. All winter long, logs are transported by trains, cars, and tractors. When spring arrives, they toss us into the river, which we call Splava. After the Splava, the logs are again transported, and again our bones broken and crushed. Amongst our family friends, Budreka lost his leg, and Dobiliana's one daughter's leg was broken, and another one lost a finger. When we receive a package, you cannot imagine how much joy there is for everyone. The children are excited and speechless until I open the package. On the top was a pair of woven gloves, which our youngest daughter, Alexita, took. After that, Iwazukas took the green sweater and gloves. Alduta got the gloves and started to try on the black jacket. The children had outgrown their coats, and we were wondering how we were going to solve this problem. For their benefit, God has given us a good-hearted aunt. Anela Shakis, we work in the lumber industry. Yuazas builds many different kinds of necessary items, equipment, and storage areas. To get to his work, he takes a train 16 kilometers and returns fully loaded. At times, he has to suffer intense cold because the train does not operate regularly. His health has become impaired. He complains of nervous tension and heart discomfort. The more tired he becomes, the more his previous injuries affect him. He is very good to his family. The children love him immensely. He is often saddened that our little ones face so many shortages. For a person who has had a broad and full life, it is very difficult facing these kinds of realities. We have a small farm which feeds us. Income is minimal and things are expensive and difficult to obtain. We live in a small room with a tiny kitchen. During the winter, we share it with the pigs and chickens. On occasion, I sew some items, or in my spare time, knit a sweater and make a little extra. Yozukas is in the second grade, where the teaching is in Russian. I have taught in Lithuanian. We receive booklets from home. He is eight years old. He is very smart, but also very sensitive. He is such a crybaby, concerned about everyone, weeping about everything. You wrote that you have not received a letter from us for quite some time. During this recent time period, we actually sent you many letters. We answered all of the letters you sent us, and we mailed you thank you notes for the packages that we received. The number of letters was large. I have lost most of my hair, and the hair that is left has changed color, has become white. With every passing day, I feel more weak and tired. It appears there is nothing better in the future. My lower back has started to hurt very much. I really need some peace and quiet. My nerves are frayed and my eyesight has worsened. It is very difficult for me to see. This year, it is very cold. At the end of June, we had to wear coats, as if it were the fall. It is now August, and the leaves are falling off the trees. As you see, it was a short summer. Alduta's health has improved somewhat. However, the doctor has ordered that she be considered an invalid at least for six months. He said that she has tuberculosis, that her blood count is low. She has started attending school. We let her attend, but all, always with fear. She wants to study and to catch up with what she has missed. A summary of the Shukis family notes. Yozuka Shukis writes, there are always better children. That seems to be a common denominator in the way Lithuanian parents raise their children. 
a little lack of uh, encouragement is, is, is a common theme. Minus 55 degrees Fahrenheit in the wintertime. Uh, that also is a recurrent theme in the letters in the Shakiz family and many other families. The fact that letters are sent and not received, another recurrent theme. Censorship was very active, uh, reviewing all the letters sent, particularly from Siberia. Aldute Shukis, second best student in the second grade, despite having tuberculosis. That's very remarkable. <laughs>